I'm so glad that you could all join us for this um, lunch and learn with one of our favorite organizations, uh, the Parent Circle Families Forum. Um, many of you have were in the sanctuary at CBST a few years ago when we hosted the alternative um, Memorial Day uh, Israeli-Palestinian memorial service uh, with Roby Damelin, who was a member of the one of the leaders of the Parent Circle and Families Forum. And today we are thrilled to welcome two others um, with, with some friends um, to share some of their story and their journey um, individually and together. And there'll be definitely time for questions and discussion later on. Um, but we are so glad that, that you are here today. Um, and Shiri Orion, who is uh, representing the American Friends of the Parent Circle, uh, is going to welcome our guest speakers today. Thank you, Rabbi Marissa, and thank you everyone for being here today. I, it does sort of feel like home in a way at CBST, um, the, the Memorial Day ceremony that we held together a few years ago um, really felt so special and it was such a warm gathering and um, it's one that I won't forget. And so I, I'm glad that we couldn't come back again and see some of you. I hope you were able to be there with us. Um, I think today's speakers, Rami al Khanan and Bassam Aramin, they need no introduction really, but what does need an introduction is the Parent Circle Families Forum, which is um, the organization that both Rami and Bassam are very long time members of. They were both the co-directors of the Parent Circle Families Forum until recently. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Parent Circle Families Forum is an organization, a joint Israeli-Palestinian organization made up of more than 600 bereaved families. So everyone has lost a loved one to the conflict and everyone has chosen a unique path of reconciliation and peace rather than revenge. Um, we are operating, as you know, in an incre incredibly hostile environment. Um, every day there's a reason why, um, why we shouldn't get up in the morning and do the work, and yet every day there uh, are countless bereaved members and Israeli and Palestinian staff people in two offices and Israeli and Palestinian alumni who have gone through our programs and Israeli and Palestinian board members who are volunteers who do, the, who do get up every morning and continue to do this work um, tirelessly. Reconciliation is not easy work. It's about generating empathy and trust and humanization of the other side of the enemy. Um, and in a situation like Israel and Palestine, where there's a total cutoff and there's a, um, there's a lot of propaganda on both sides and there are politicians and people in the media determined to keep people apart, um, that there are a lot of uh, tough barriers to get through. But I, I, I'm convinced that when you hear Rami and Bassam speak today, you'll know that their stories and their hearts and their messages are stronger than any of those barriers. So we just have to continue to listen and we have to continue to share the messages. Um, Rami and Bassam, for those of you that don't know, are also the protagonists of a novel, an award-winning novel written by best-selling author Colin McCann. The name of the novel is A Paragon, and maybe Anita, you can write that in the chat since it's not a, a typical mm -hmm. word. Right. Um, it's uh, and, and a pair, I'm telling you about A Paragon, first of all, because everybody should read it, but also because it's been an incredible uh, door opener, not only for but about Bassam and Rami and about the parent circle, but about Israel and Palestine and the human cost of the conflict and, um, you know, how we change people's minds one heart at a time. So without further ado, I give you my two favorite people in the world. Um, they always start with a fight and their fight is not about land or borders. It's about who goes first. No, this time we need to fight about land. So Jerusalem ah. is ours before okay. we start. <laughs> that's good. It's good to have a change. 
Rami gone. Thank you, Please. Habibi. Thank you, Shiri. You are always the best. Uh, this uh, Palestinian terrorist, Bassam Aramin, uh, is uh, probably the closest person to me on earth. Uh, he's much closer to me than many of my own people, many of my own family. What makes us so uh, close is the price that we both have paid as an outcome of this ongoing conflict between our two nations. We don't need the words to understand each other. We share the same kind of pain. For me, Bassam uh, is a leader. I look up to him. I admire him. He's a light in the dark. And uh, I take a lot of strength out of him and uh, my other brothers and sisters, Israelis and Palestinians, members of this unique organization of ours, which is probably the only organization on earth that does not seek new members. Uh, my name is Ramir Hanan. I'm a 72 years old graphic designer living in Jerusalem. I was born in Jerusalem, seventh generation. Uh, my uh, mother was born here in the old city of Jerusalem, uh, an ultra Orthodox Jewish family. Uh, my father came to this country in 1946 after spending one year in Auschwitz. He was very badly wounded in the 48 war. She was the nurse that took care of him. And this is the reason why I'm able to speak to you right now. I am a Jew. I'm an Israeli. And before anything else, I am a human being. The story I'm going to tell you uh, starts and also ends on a particular day of the Jewish calendar, which is known by the name of Yom Kippur. You know, for us, it's the holiest day of the year. This is the day where you ask forgiveness for your sins. On this uh, very day, 47 years ago, I was a very young soldier fighting this horrible October 73 war. We have started it with a company of 11 tanks. We finished it with only Three I've lost over there in the desert of Sinai and across the Suez Canal, some of my very close and best friends. And I came out of this uh, war very angry and bitter and disappointed young men with one determination to detach myself from any kind of commitment or involvement to mind my own business. I got out of the army. I went to Bezalel Art School to become a graphic designer. I got married and I had four kids. And uh, 37 years ago, on the very eve of Yom Kippur, September 1983, my daughter was born in Hadassah Hospital in uh, Jerusalem. Her name was Smadar. The name Smadar is taken from the Bible, the Song of Solomon. It means the grape of vine, the opening of the flower. She really was a very uh, sparkling and joyful and energetic and uh, Wise little girl, uh, she was uh, uh, always laughing. She was an excellent student. She was a dancer, she was a swimmer. She played the piano, she was amazing. And everybody used to call her the princess. And we lived a very good life in our house in uh, Jerusalem. My wife, which is a professor for education in the Hebrew University, my three boys. And this princess, it was seemed to be the perfect, uh, sheltered uh, environment. Uh, in many ways, you could say that we put ourselves inside a big bubble, completely detached from the outside world. I was doing graphic design for the right wing, for the left wing, whoever paid me. And life was relatively beautiful. And this went on until about uh, 24 years ago. On the 4th of uh, September, 1997, just a few days before, Yom Kippur. It was the first day of school. Uh, these girls went to buy some new books in Ben Yehuda Mall in Jerusalem. Uh, and the bubble we were living in was blown up to me. They killed five people that day, including three little girls. One of these girls was my 14 years old Spadar. It was a Thursday afternoon. 
and the beginning of a very long and a very cold night, which continues until today. At first, when you hear about the explosion, you keep hoping that maybe this time, this uh, finger will not turn towards you. Then gradually you find yourself running in the streets, trying to find her, she completely uh, disappeared. And you go from hospital to hospital, from police station to police station. Many long and uh, frustrating hours until eventually very, very late at night, you find yourself in the morgue and this finger is stuck right between your eyes. And you see this sight which you will never ever be able to forget for the rest of your life. And then you come back home, the house is filled with thousands and thousands of uh, people coming to pay respect, to offer condolences. These are the seven days of the Jewish mourning period, the Shiva. And you are kind of enveloped by these thousands of people in a very clever traditional way that is designed to ease your passage to the new kind of life which expects you on the other hand. On the eighth day, they all go back to their homes, to their everyday uh, businesses, and you are left alone. You need to wake up. You need to stand up and face yourself, and you have to make a decision. What are you going to do now with this new unbearable burden on your shoulders? What are you going to do now with this new personality of yourself, which you never thought could have existed? What are you going to do with this anger? that eats you alive from within. And there are only two options, two ways to choose from. And the first one is obvious. When someone kills your 14 years old little girl, you are so angry and you wanna get even. This is natural, this is human. This is the way most people choose, the way of revenge and retaliation. This way that creates this endless cycle of violence and uh, retaliation and blood. But then after a while, you start to think, you know, we're human beings, we're not animals, we can use our heads. And you start asking yourself questions. Will killing anyone will uh, bring her back? Will causing pain to someone will ease this unbearable pain? And the answer is certainly not. So in a very graduate and complicated process, you come to the other option, which is much more difficult, trying to understand what happened here. Why did it happen? How could such a horrible thing take place? What can cause someone to be that angry, that mad, that desperate and hopeless that he's willing to blow himself up with 14 years old little girl? Do you have some kind of uh, connection or responsibility yourself? Well, it's not easy. It takes time, it took me almost a year. Foolishly enough, at the beginning, I thought that I could go on with my life, pretending as if nothing had happened, go back to my studio, try to lead a normal life, but nothing was normal anymore. I was not the same person anymore. And about a year later, on some occasion, I met a big man who changed my life completely. His name was Itzhak Frankenthal. He was a religious Jewish guy, you know, with a big kippah on his head. You know how we tend to put people into drawers and stigmatize people and we judge people by the way they look and what they put on their heads around their necks. And I was certain that this guy, Sfak Frankenthal, was a fascist and a right winger, that he eats Arabs for breakfast. I, I prepared myself to fight him. We started talking. He told me about his son, Arik, a soldier who was uh, kidnapped and murdered by Hamas in 1994. And about this organization that he created of people who lost their loved ones, Israelis and Palestinians, who seek uh, peace rather than uh, revenge. And I remember that, that this guy, Ishak Frankenthal, was one of these thousands of people that came to my house during the seven days of mourning a year before. And I went crazy. I was so angry with him. I asked him, how could you do it? How could you step into someone's house who just lost his daughter? and talk about peace, how dare you? And he being the great guy that he was, was not insulted. He just invited me over to watch a meeting of this group of crazy people. And I got a little bit curious. I said, okay, I went to see. It was 23 years ago. I was standing aside, very detached, very reluctant and very, very cynical as I always am. 
And I was watching those people coming down from the buses. And from the buses came down people that, for me, as an Israeli patriot, were always living legends. People I used to look up to them. I used to admire them. I used to read about them in the newspapers. And I never, ever thought that one day I will become one of them. But then I saw uh, something else. I saw something which was completely new to me, to my eyes, to my mind and to my soul. I was standing there watching the Palestinian bereaved families coming down from the buses, walking towards me, shaking my hand for peace, hugging me, crying with me. And I was so deeply shocked and so deeply moved. You see, I was 47 years old at the time. And until today, I'm ashamed to admit it was the first time ever in my life I have met Palestinians as human beings, not as workers in the streets, not as uh, terrorists, not as uh, transparent people, as human beings, people who carry exactly the same burden that I carry, people who suffer exactly like I suffer. And I was so deeply moved. I remember seeing this uh, old Arab lady coming down from the bus with this uh, long black uh, traditional Palestinian dress. And she had a picture of a six years old kid on her chest, exactly like my, like my wife, carry the name of our daughter Smadari on hers. I'm not a religious person. I have no way of explaining what happened to me back then. 23 years ago, all I can tell you from that moment on until today, I devote my life to go everywhere possible, anywhere, to talk to anyone possible, people who want to listen and people who will not listen, to convey this very basic and very simple message which says we are not doomed. This is not our destiny to keep on killing each other in this holy land of ours forever. We can change it. We can break once and for all this endless cycle of violence and revenge and retaliation. And the only way to do it is simply by talking to each other because it will not stop unless we talk. I believe deeply that one can teach himself how uh, to listen. I believe that once you are able to listen to the pain of the other, you can expect the other to listen to your pain. And then only then together start this very long journey towards some kind of reconciliation, maybe some kind of peace in the end. It's a very long and bumpy road, no shortcuts, but this is the only way possible because the other way leads to nowhere. And the price of the other way is really horrible Believe me, I know what I'm saying. So this is what we are trying to do. My brother Bassam here beside me, Shiri, Anita, and all the members of the parent circle. We bang our heads against this very high wall of hatred and fear that divide our two nations today. And we put cracks in it, crack after crack. And through these little cracks, a little light comes in. A little light can drive away a lot of darkness until we will put those walls down because the alternative is horrible. And we have an enormous ally on our side, which is the power of our pain. You should know that the power of pain is really tremendous. It's very much similar to the nuclear energy. And like this uh, horrible energy, you can use it in order to bring darkness and destruction and pain and death to people. And you can use it in order to bring light and warm and hope. So we go around the country, we go from high school to high school, we speak to people, we speak to Israelis, we speak to Palestinians and we tell them, that our blood is exactly the same color and our pain is exactly the same pain and our tears are just as bitter. And if we who have every reason on earth to want to kill each other, if we who have every reason on earth to hate each other, if we can call each other brother, then anyone should. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, today I have two lectures in Israeli high school in Tel Aviv. Uh, 
And I still think about this meeting, it was very special, because one of the kids asked me, how come that kids at the age of 12 and 13, they are thinking about fighting uh, or using terror against the Israelis? Which kind of education you have? Then I start to think myself about myself when I was 13 years old. And I remember I met the head of the Shabak in the 80s uh, in 2006. And I told him that, you know, that you are following me at the age of 13 and you create from me a fighter or a warrior or a terrorist for you. And he said, absolutely, you are right. I agree with you. So uh, you become victim of the circumstances of the environment. Uh, it's not normal for kids to think about fighting. It's not their job, but they think they are, they have nothing to do except to resist. It's not to establish a Palestinian state as I thought, it's to feel safe because we have no safe place for ourselves as kids. Uh, I spent seven years in the Israeli jails when I was 17 years old. I think according to uh, Begin in his uh, book, The Revolution, he mentioned that the jail is a flower and every Palestinian must smell it. So I, I went to smell it for seven years uh, because I was at the age of 13 with other four kids uh, we start to raise the Palestinian flag, which was a crime in that time. Uh, at the age of 16, we find some old weapons in a cave uh, with military materials that we don't know how to use it, including two hand grenades. Uh, uh, two of my friends throw the two grenades on the Israeli patrol soldiers in our village near Hebron. And in that time, no one killed, no one injured because they don't know how to use it in a professional way. And at the age of 17, we have been arrested. So the first one get 21 years uh, in jail, 19, 15, 14, and I had seven years. Uh, I watch a movie about the Holocaust in jail. And what I know about the Holocaust, it's someone called Hitler killed 6 million Jews, but it's a big lie. Uh, in spite it's a big lie, I want to enjoy seeing how Hitler uh, 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 oppressed the, Israel, the Jewish people, how he occupied them, at least because I am in their jails. But after a few minutes, I found myself uh, crying, get sympathy with those innocent people. It was very difficult for me to try to understand that they are human beings, can do the same to other human beings. Uh, I convinced myself it's just a movie and nothing like this in the reality because I cannot accept this behavior. It's very difficult for me. But I decide that I want to know more about this big lie, if it's really happened or it's just a movie propaganda. Uh, after so many years, before 10 years only, I make my master's degree about the Holocaust uh, in Bradford University in the UK. Then after that, I start to visit death camps uh, in Germany. For me, it was like a tool to know your enemy in order to know how to kill them or to defeat, or to defeat them. Uh, then you understand that if you know more, you act better. If you don't know, you are a victim to yourself, to your education, to your narrative, to your history, and always it's good to agree with yourself. Uh, I go back to jail, it's a long seven years. Uh, it's very difficult seven years. Uh, it's very difficult to keep your humanity and to act as a normal human beings because their goal is to kill our humanity every moment for them. We are the terrorists, we are the killers, we are the bad guys. And for us, they are the killers, they are the occupiers, they are the criminals, and they are not our example. We are freedom fighters. 
and we need to keep our humanity and to act as freedom fighters. So it's also another internal conflict between the moralities in both sides. Uh, briefly, you become just more determined to continue your struggle against this brutal enemy. I uh, get released in 1992 after seven years, and I still believe in armed struggle as the only way to talk to those people. Uh, in 93, as you know, we have Oslo agreement for the first time between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Suddenly we have peace. Uh, and I start to think about why I spent seven years in jail. Uh, why those leaders didn't make it five years before, 10 years, 20 years, they will save thousands of lives between the Israelis and the Palestinians if in the end we need to negotiate with our enemy. Uh, I discovered in that time that more than 100 years we are trying to kill each other, to defeat each other uh, in spite, you know, Israel with the United States of America, with the rest of the world, for the Palestinians, against the Palestinians, but we forget to die, we're still here. Israel is not safe and Palestine is not free, but more blood, more pain, more victims, but we still exist, both sides. Uh, it's a long process to change yourself. Uh, I decided in 2000, oh, 1994, in fact, to change my mind. It's not in one day, it's a long process to say that's it, I'm not going to use or support army struggle because it doesn't work. And I start to be uh, active in my society, in the Palestinian side, without any connection with the other side. Uh, until 2003, I hear in the Israeli media about something called refuseniks. It's exactly like veterans for peace in the States. Uh, ex-Israeli soldiers and officers who refused to serve in Palestine or in the occupied territories because they love Israel, because they want to live in a moral place, because they don't want to be part of this illegal and immoral occupation to another people, and because it's against the Zionist values, which is very strange for the Palestinians. But I wish to meet those people to understand why they refuse to continue uh, occupying us. Uh, in 2005, we had the first meeting by chance between four Palestinians. I was one of them. And with seven ex-Israeli officers, Rami's son was among them. This is how I get to know this noble enemy in 2005. Uh, it was the most difficult meeting for each one of us. You cannot imagine. We know each other personally from the checkpoints. We know them. Uh, we did our best to kill each other physically from both sides. We hate each other. And imagine this dialogue between those real enemies. Uh, briefly, it takes one year meetings. We start with 11 people. In the end of the year, we became 300 members, all of them ex-enemies, ex-fighters. Uh, in the end of the year, we create a movement. We call it Combatants for Peace. And our slogan was what Nelson Mandela says. Uh, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you need to work with your enemy. Then he became your partner. It's not only to talk to your enemy. We need to work together. And we start to work in both sides, in Israel and Palestine, to say that we are your fighters. We go to fight in your name, in your behalf. We change our way. Uh, two years before, in the 16th of January, 2000, two years after, uh, in the 16th of January, 2007, uh, an Israeli border police shot and killed my 10 years old daughter, Abir, uh, in the front of her school from a distance of 15 to 20 meters uh, in her head from the back. Uh, Abir fell down, and two days later, she passed away in Hadassah Hospital, where she born, and where Smadar born and died. Between Abir and Smadar, it's 10 years, but we believe it's the same killer, the same criminal who take off the lives of our daughters. It's the Israeli occupation. This is our common enemy. 
we claim that if there is no occupation, we don't need to fight each other. Avir and Smadar do know nothing about the occupation, but they have been killed because unfortunately they are Israelis and Palestinians. From the first meeting, from the first moment, I said, I wish Abir will be the last victim between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Unfortunately, since 2000 to 2007, uh, 971 Palestinian kids have been killed. And in the same period, 197 Israeli kids have been killed. In fact, two hours after the tragedy, I found my brother Rami and his wife uh, uh, come to the hospital with more than 30 Israeli families who stay with me two days praying for little Abir, but unfortunately she passed away. Uh, so I joined the parents circle two days after because I know Rami two years before from uh, combatants for peace. Always I want to ask him about Smadar. But always I said to myself, why I need to invest in more sadness in his heart? Maybe he forget sometimes, because sometimes we laugh, we make jokes, so I don't need to remind him. After my tragedy, I discovered that we never forget, we will never forget, unfortunately. Uh, and I told him that we just try to run away from our pain to our pain. There is no other option. Uh, we need to learn how to live side by side with this ongoing pain forever. Uh, it's a long process, as I said, to change yourself. Uh, Jalal Eddin Rumi says, yesterday I was clever, so I start to change the world. Today I am wise, so I start to change myself. Nothing changed, but I changed myself. I changed my view, how to see things. Uh, I met the victim who killed my daughter after three and a half years in the Israeli court. And I said to him, I need you to know that you are not a warrior uh, or a hero. You didn't kill the enemy or the terrorist. You just killed 10 years innocent girl. And if you think it's okay to kill my daughter, Enjoy your crime. I don't ask for revenge because I don't take revenge from victims. For me, you are not less victim than your victim. But in any day in your life, if you come to ask me to forgive you, always you will find me there. I will forgive you. But it's not because of yourself. It's because of myself. Because I really love my daughter very much. And because I have another five kids. I don't want them to be victims to you. I want to raise them up in a different way. In the parent circle, as my brother mentioned, we are more than 620 families, Israelis and Palestinians, who have all the right to hate each other, even to try to kill each other. We come together and we discover because we love our kids. We don't want to continue their way means to prepare our other kids to kill and to die. I believe that we kill our kids with our own hands, but in a very gentle way, we want them to take revenge and to protect the holy stones of Jerusalem. We decide and we believe that we have the moral authority to raise up our voice and to say no more blood, no more war. And we know this ongoing pain. Uh, I believe that the Israelis will never give up their safe place. After 3,000 years of slavery and discrimination and anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, and I believe the Palestinians, after 3,000 years from tonight, they will never ever accept the Israeli occupation or the Israeli control, or whatever you call it. We must be free. We need to live free as free human beings. So as long as the occupation continue, we will continue to, sac to sacrifice the blood of our kids for the great homeland, for the great stones, and for the great corrupted leaders. 
I believe my blood, our blood, our kids' blood is more holy than any holy place. If it's Jerusalem or if it's even Mecca or Al Kaaba. So we need to understand that. Uh, for that, we want to prove that we can be partners only. We don't need to love each other. We can survive each side alone without hugging each other and without eating hummus together in general, but not Rami. Uh, 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 we need to respect each other. We have the right to exist. Respect me, my rights, and you can enjoy hating me forever. But we prove that we can be real partners, we can be friends, we can be brothers, and in our case, we can be family. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Rami and Bassam. Uh, we have a secret agreement between us that all the difficult questions will go to him and the rest to me. You can ask any question that comes to your head, personal, political, whatever. We know all the answers by heart. Please don't be shy. And actually, I'd like to um, also just say a word that um, when I moved to Jerusalem in 2007, um, I was deeply grateful to meet uh, to meet people from Combatants for Peace, um, to meet people from the, the, the Bereaved Families Forum. Um, when I was a, a teenager, uh, about three months before Rabin was assassinated, one of my beloved teachers was killed in a bus bombing in Jerusalem. And I very much spent my five years living there trying to understand and trying to find, and it's a very different kind of pain when it's a, a teacher than when it's a child, right? When it's a family member, it's a much more intense loss. Um, but I just want to say how grateful I am um, for the work that both of you have done and for the model that the whole organization has, has held up because it, there is so much loss, there is so much pain. And Basam, I love what you say, like, you know, you could re respect me and then you can hate me for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, you know, recognizing the humanity and saying, great, we, we're, we're here. How do we, how do we be here? in a way that is going to be somehow healthy. Um, and I will share in the chat, there was a video that the Parent Circle put out a few years ago that um, I still find so deeply powerful with a variety of members of the, the Bereaved Families Forum saying, we don't want you here, um, right? This is, this is probably the only organization in the world where sort of their logo is, we do not want growth. We do not want more members, that our goal is to have no new members in this group. Um, so I, I thank you both so much for being willing to share these stories over and over again. And, um, and may Smadar and Abir's memories continue to bless you and to bless all of us through the work that you do. Thank you. Um, so you can, if you, if you wanna raise hands either like this, cause we can see you um, or electronically either is fine um, with any kind of questions at all. And I can guarantee that Rami and Bassam have heard every possible question before. Nothing you can say will be offensive or surprising. <laughs> There's a question in the chat um, from Patty. Um, Patty is asking about the, um, the percentage of people that you encounter outside of the organization that are interested in peace and getting to know each other. And if that's a low percentage, how do you remain hopeful? Can we, can we see Patty? Patty, will you show yourself? And Carol and Judy Winters and Nahum. <laughs> if you're able to join us on screen, we'd love to be able to see you even if it's just for a moment. Thank you. We know that some people don't always have very strong internet and so they turn off their camera so they can hear the whole thing. So that might be. Patty said that they're trying. Rami, how do you keep uh, hope? By looking uh, in your eyes every morning and uh, mm -hmm. get the strength out of it. Um, Uh, 
a divided uh, society. You know the feeling uh, after four Trump years. Well, for us, it's uh, 10 times uh, uh, worth. And uh, we are really facing, uh, we are like people who are drawing water from the ocean with a little spoonful of little holes. Um, but we believe that we are doing a sacred work. We believe that our voice is essential. We are the only ones who have the moral authority to step into a high school class to those uh, brainwashed kids. Uh, for most of them, it's the first time ever in their life they see an Israeli and a Palestinian together, which are not uh, willing to kill each other, which are calling each other brother, which are not putting their pain on the table, trying to, cure, to compare whose pain is bigger. And this meeting uh, creates an earthquake. And the earthquake creates the crack in the wall that I was speaking about. Uh, and for us, it's uh, the most uh, important thing because uh, even if in the end of the class, there will be only one kid, Israeli or Palestinian, who nods his head with acceptance to this joint message of ours, it's, it's kind of a miracle. It means that we saved one drop of blood. In Judaism, one drop of blood is the whole world. And in fact, the reaction that we get from the kids, no one can listen to us and remain the same. This is our mission. This is our goal. This is our target. This is what we do. I have hope because I know that in the end we will have, we will live in peace. And it's not the first conflict on earth and it's not the last one, unfortunately. But just remember that the Palestinians didn't kill 6 million Israelis. The Israelis didn't kill 6 million Palestinians. And there is a German ambassador in Tel Aviv. And there is an Israeli ambassador in Berlin. So we can do it. We need just a brave leader who take us to the future and to release us from the painful past uh, and stop creating uh, uh, more victimhood mentality. Uh, we are not going to continue killing each other forever. And one day we'll have peace agreement, but when? We don't know how much blood for those uh, great politicians to decide to sign the same agreement 40 years ago, the same. We don't know, but in one day they will sign it. And as we know, the 1,000 step start with one step. We need to continue working, not only for our grandsons and daughters, for ourselves. So we will have uh, the courage to look into their eyes and to say, we did our best to achieve peace. Um, Rami and Bassam, uh, one of the things that's come up in so many of our encounters is how you have dealt with your own friends and family who have resisted your work starting from the beginning. And can you talk a little bit about that, how your own friends and family have, um, for the ones who disagree with you, how that, how that has been, what kind of uh, reaction you've gotten over the years and how you've handled that? Well, it, it uh, sometimes can get very complicated and very difficult. I've lost many, many friends. I gained many, many new friends. Uh, it's a matter of choice. You wake up in the morning after a long and sleepless night, you climb out of your black hole and you decide I will choose this way and I'm willing to pay the price of choosing this way. And uh, as long as you see your uh, target very clearly, very sharply, then all the other uh, prices uh, are getting very small. You know, in fact, I, I learn a very difficult habit. It's to listen. If you don't listen to the others, you cannot listen to yourself even and they are not going to listen to you. Even sometimes if they talk about a very stupid thing, 
this is their narrative. This is their opinion. So in fact, I, I learned deeply how to listen to the others. And this is what we are doing in the parent circle. We listen to each other. Uh, then the others will listen to you. Uh, in fact, I never lose any friend in the Palestinian side, I mean. Uh, even the people who don't agree with me, they respect me. Uh, because I'm working, it's not a personal problem between me or my family and Israel. I am part of the Palestinian society. And uh, because I spent seven years in jail, uh, I lost my daughter. So I have the right to talk. So it's up to you to take this right and raise your voice and talk and represent the minority, unfortunately, or to keep silence and represent the uh, majority. And in our case, we cannot keep silence. Always we said the worst already happened. So we have no fear. It's a personal responsibility because we believe this is the only way that we need to act in order to protect our kids. And nothing more important than our kids. I would love to know, um, how, how often do you do these talks? You mentioned um, having done this in, in schools. Um, for teenagers, uh, and I, I see that the Reconstructionist uh, Rabbinical Association will also be hosting you shortly, uh, which is my professional organization, so I love to see that. Um, how often do you do this? And I guess my curiosity is, does, does, it, does it help you to be telling this story so often, um, or does it take something out of you to tell, take, tell the story so often, or both? Well, it can take... Uh can get up to five times a day. Uh, in times where we are traveling, uh, we can do uh, seven meetings a day. Uh, I think the most uh, heart touching explanation is what Colin McCann gave um, in a Paragon. Uh, you know, a Paragon is built like a thousand and one uh, stories like uh, Shahrazad who were telling uh, the stories to the king in order to stay alive. And he uh, says that we are telling the story to keep our daughters alive. Uh, and it's, it's a mission for us. I mean, telling the story so many times, it's, it's a way of keeping them vivid, uh, uh, standing behind our shoulders, pushing us forward, telling us this is the right way this, this is where you want to go. I remember in 2008, uh, uh, it was seven times in that day, seven lectures. And in the last one, we were in San Francisco. I was very exhausted. If I want, if I need to go to negotiation, I will give Jerusalem and the West Bank and Gaza for free. <laughs> and a Jewish lady, she came to talk to me and she said, you look like a, a gentle Arab or Palestinian that time. Why you need this uh, uh, terrorism against the Israelis? Why you didn't announce like to release the prisoners and the separation wall, uh, the, sorry, the checkpoints, so she think we occupied the Israelis. She know, not she think. So I said to her, seriously, you know what? You convinced me. Now I will announce that we need to release all the Israeli prisoners from the Palestinian jails. No checkpoints between Palestine and Israel. Uh, and that's it. And she said, are you ready to say that in front of the people? I said, of course. Even in CNN, I, I will announce that. Uh, for your question, how, how often you do it, as Rami says, uh, it's always painful. It's always go again and again to the same very painful memories. But it's, yeah, we try to keep the girls alive. And it's kind of healing, but you will never heal. 
It's like for their memories. We think we do a positive thing to spread this message through uh, uh, the parent circle. Uh, I wrote in Abir's grave that your killer will die and you will live longer than him by telling your story every day, in any time. Uh, three days ago, we have a, a talk at 4 p.m. a.m. in the morning. Imagine, but, uh, and we have another one at five in a few days. <laughs> Anytime, your message or your life become your message. We devote ourselves to spend, to spread this message. It's, I, this is how I am. This is Rami. I don't, I don't. I don't take responsibility for the 4 a.m. and the 5 a.m. meetings, but I do take responsibility for the the five meetings a day in, in the United States when they visit here. And, and sadly, we haven't had Rami and Bassam in the United States since February of 2020, right when COVID broke out and we were on their book tour and um, we had to cut it short. Um, just in general, we we do about 450 dialogue meetings. This is what we call a dialogue meeting um, every year in Israeli high schools and Palestinian communities and people's homes, mostly in Israel and Palestine, but also to American communities and international communities. And um, I think if I can ask one thing of everybody here today um, to do when you leave here is think about one community or one group that um, would open their doors to the parent circle, the brief families forum, and to hear the messages of Rami and Bassam. And every time we open another door, more and more people hear more, our messages, more and more people sign up to support the work of the parent circle. And, and, and I think that after we hear their stories, that's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to do that. Um, I saw Jeremy raised his hand. Jeremy, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? And this, I think, is going to be our last question. Well, Rami and Bassam, you've been doing your incredible work for so long. Uh, do you see any reflection in the political process of anything that resembles anything that you've been trying to do? Um, it's your department. <laughs> uh, no, uh, <laughs> we are fighting, uh, as the story tells, not to let about the demonstrator in front of the White House, not to let uh, reality to change us. Uh, because reality is very dark and ugly these days, but we are capable because of our uh, moral authority, because of the price that we uh, have paid to show another way, to show another option, to show a possibility. This is our mission and we should keep on doing it no matter what. And this is what we'll do. And, uh, I, I would like to have, have permission to say one last word for questions that was not asked if I may. Uh, the question was, what can we do? Uh, and usually uh, I, uh, I, I say this, uh, you, you remember I told you that I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. My late father was an Auschwitz graduate. Uh, and uh, 75 years ago, while well, they took my grandparents to the ovens back in Europe, the free and civilized world stood aside, never lifting one finger. And today, after so many years, while well, these two crazy nations of ours are massacring each other without any mercy, while this genocide is taking place in uh, Syria, while uh, refugees are drowning in the Mediterranean like uh, flies and no one cares, and the free and civilized world is still standing aside, doing nothing, which is really uh, horrible. It's a crime because standing aside 
while a crime is being committed is also a crime. Now, we do not ask of you to be pro-Israeli or to be pro-Palestinian. We don't need that. It won't help us. We demand of you to be pro-peace, to be against injustice and again against this ongoing situation in which one people is dominating another people. This is the essence of our problem. It can be changed. It must be changed. And I will finish with a, a message of a Jew. And I am a Jew with the utmost respect to my people, to my tradition, to my history. And I will tell you that ruling and oppressing and humiliating millions and millions of people for so many years without any democratic right is not Jewish, period. No two ways about it. And being against it is not anti-Semitism. And if uh, you get into a quarrel with someone, you can quote me. Now, I would like to urge you to get into our website, theparentcircle.org, read more stories like ours, read about our activities. What do we do in order to put these cracks in the wall? And when you get to the bottom of it, there is a, a little round button. It says donate, please push it. Thank you. And my last word, I agree with Rami. <laughs> Rami and Bassam, thank you so much. Um, it is always a, a deeply moving experience to hear from, from anyone from the parent circle and especially the two of you um, with you. the relationship that you have um, is such a beautiful model and, and I cannot tell you how grateful we are. Thank you, it's because he loves me. Thank you so much. And we look forward to one day <laughs> being able to host you in person. Okay, with a pleasure. Next year in Jerusalem. Thank you. Next year in the other holy city of New York, perhaps. <laughs> Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all so Bye. much. Thank you so much. And peace. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Peace. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.